Jesus Christ died on the cross to save us from our sins and make us right with God. And it didn't end there because he rose again on the third day to bring us victory and life as well. In just a minute, we're going to read from Mark chapter 10. If you want to take your Bibles and start turning to there. We've been talking about the next generation, the generation that is sometimes called iGen, born from 1995 through 2012. This is a a unique generation, but this is a point I want to mention in every one of these sermons is that iGen might be unique, but Jesus is for every generation. It doesn't matter when you were born or where you were born, or what events and circumstances have shaped you to be the person that you are today. It doesn't matter. Jesus is for you. And He has something for you. He might stretch you in different ways, depending on the kind of person that you've developed to be. But He is for everyone. So there's different generations. There's uh, the silent generation, so-called. There are the boomers. Generation X, Millennials, and then iGen. And these, these, these dates are kind of fuzzy, of course. I mean, this, is not, this is not completely scientific, but each generation has been shaped by different events and circumstances and even technology. And so it's interesting to reflect on the time that we were born and what has shaped us and developed us. But for iGen... Uh, The next generation, our kids, grandkids, maybe great-grandkids, they are shaped by internet, by individualism, they are inclusive, they are irreligious, they are insulated, and today we'll talk a little bit about how there's a tendency for them to be insecure. Let's look at this passage here. And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said to him, Teacher, all these I have kept from my youth. And Jesus, looking at him, loved him, and said to him, You lack one thing. Go, sell all you have, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How difficult it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said to them again, Children, how difficult it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And they were exceedingly astonished and said to him, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Peter began to say to him, See, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life But many who are first will be last, and the last first. There's a lot going on in this passage, a lot that could be talked about. I'm just going to call attention to a few things here. In verse 18, Jesus asked the rich man what he means by good. The The teacher says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, why do you call me good? What do, you, what do you mean by that? Do you, what, what is your understanding of, of good? In, in the reality, only God is, is truly good. 
This rich man probably had a warped view of what good was. He probably thought he himself was a good man. He says, I've obeyed all these commandments since my youth. I'm a good guy. So Jesus says to clarify that for him, what do you mean by good? What, what, is that, what is that in your mind? Only God is truly good. We, we can be nice people, but if we are honest with ourselves, we, we do have tendencies to be selfish, to be proud, to be thoughtless and careless. We have a tendency to go away from God. Or we have a tendency to just want God for the good things that He gives us and not for His own sake. And in verse 21, Jesus looking at him loved him, it says. Jesus loved this man. He was not looking to shame him. He was not looking to push him aside or just to get rid of him or anything like that. He, he actually loved this man. He wanted what was best for this man. He loved him. But in loving this man, Jesus gave an answer to this man that was quite disappointing. Jesus' answer made this man sad. Look at it one more time here. It says, You lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. And this man was disheartened, as you can imagine. I think that if Jesus was looking at any one of us and saying that very thing, I'm guessing that most of us, if not all of us, would probably have a similar response. Being in the United States at this time, in this place, even the poorest among us, are very rich compared to most people of history. We, we are the 1%. We hear talk about the 1% sometimes, but if you want to look at the rest of the world, if you want to look at the rest of history, we are the 1%. And so, when I read this, I tend to think of myself as this rich young man. As, as part of the 1%, this would apply to me. And when I see how this man responded, I feel the same way. Jesus' answer made this man sad, and it's, it's kind of not difficult to see why. And then the last verse. It says, Many who are first will be last, and the last first and the point to be made there is that those society approves are not those that God approves. What we value, what we think is important, the opinions of people that we think are important, those aren't the things that God thinks are important. We, we might want approval and recognition from certain people or organizations or whatever, but it's really God's opinion that counts. And the things... The people who get put first in this life, the people who have the highest opinions, Jesus says many are our first will be last, and the last first. So, this new generation that is growing up right now, the oldest of this group is in college. iGen is easily the safest generation covered this in one sermon before, but I want to mention some of this again. This is a generation that had car seats. They were picked up at school. They did not walk home. They had sanitized plastic playground. They were supervised at every moment. Uh, keeping safe and staying safe in American books has jumped exponentially since the 1990s. I Jenners are much less likely to be in a car accident or get a traffic ticket. Less likely. That doesn't mean it doesn't happen, but less likely. I Jenners, they wear seat belts much more than other generations do. Two times the high schoolers always wore seat belts in 2015 as opposed to 1989. IGEN is much less likely to get in a car driven by somebody who is drinking. They are much less likely to binge drink. 
Iogen is much less likely to physically fight. So the homicide rate is going down among this group of people, these, this generation. Iogen is less likely to agree with the statement, I like to test myself every now and again by doing something a little risky. So this is a generation that is not, as a rule, risk takers. So, and this is from the book, we protect our children from danger, real and imaginary, and are then surprised when they go to college and create safe spaces designed to repel the real world. So, and here's some new material. Generally speaking, iGen is emotionally fragile. As a rule, this generation is emotionally fragile. They're they're sensitive. 12th graders, as uh, they are being surveyed as they are exiting high school, their satisfaction with life and with their self, themselves as a whole, is at all-time lows right now. The statements, I can't do anything right, my life is not useful, and I do not enjoy life, those very depressed statements are at all-time highs right now. This is a generation that is emotionally quite fragile. And more and more iGeners, compared to other generations, they can't handle other people's opinions. So, for example, there's a writer named Claire Fox who was going to an all-girls high school for debate. She expected a challenge. She expected people to disagree with her. What she didn't expect were tears and weeping, and girls saying, you can't say that. No rational arguments or rebuttals, just, you can't say that. There was a president of Oklahoma Wesleyan University who was giving a sermon on love from 1 Corinthians, and he preached this sermon, and afterwards a student came up to him and said that he felt victimized by the sermon. And he said, well, why? Well, because the sermon made him feel bad for not showing love. You said that we needed to show more love, and, and uh, that made me feel bad. I, I'm victimized by your sermon. The speaker, this, this guy was wrong for making him feel uncomfortable. Well, just briefly... If my sermons make you uncomfortable, that's a good thing. Because all of us can improve, right? Especially when we're talking about God and holiness and such. We can all learn, we can all grow, we can all improve, right? So if you feel a little uncomfortable sometimes, that's okay. That's what's supposed to happen, actually. Anyways, I'll get off that soapbox for a moment. We'll come back to that. Colleges disinviting speakers is at an all-time high. When students throw a fuss or protest, then speakers get disinvited. That's all at an all-time high. There's even headlines appearing in newspapers. I'm a liberal professor and my liberal students terrify me. So professors are being fired for assigning offensive texts like Mark Twain. Uh... There was some incident in Emory University in 2016 during the the presidential election coming up. Somebody wrote in chalk, Trump 2016, all over the sidewalks. And uh, there was a protest because of that. And it wasn't even against the people using the chalk, actually. It was even against the administrators. And in this protest, they chanted, You're not listening. Come speak to us. We are in pain. This is a generation as a rule, again, not every last person in this generation, but as a rule, this is a generation that has difficulty with different opinions. And I think part of the reason is that our society has created, equated love with good feelings. We think that love is feeling good. It means making me feel good. It means keeping me safe from people who might make me feel bad. 
for any reason. And keeping me even from hearing what might make me feel bad. If you love me, then I will feel good all the time. We've equated love and good feelings, I think, quite a bit. But like Jesus and this rich young man, he says only God is good. Only God is truly good. Our, our notion of good is, is really distorted. None of us are God. And so, really, we don't completely understand what good is, even if we have a, you know, even the best of us have a distorted view of what good is, because only God is good. And that we think that we know what is good shows quite a bit when we end up chasing things that turn out not to be good for us at all. Which is why there's a lot of people who have drug problems, for example. Or people who think money is going to make them happy and it doesn't. Or perhaps popularity. People chase these things. They think it's going to make them happy. And it doesn't. We need God to know what good is. We need God to explain what good is to to us. We need God to tell us about who He is so that we can understand what good is. And then we can go for it. Otherwise, we wouldn't really know. we just have a vague idea about it. In the cross, Christ has shown us that love is sacrifice. Love is not good feelings. You might get some good feelings from it once in a while, but love is not the same as good feelings. It did not feel good to hang on that cross to save us from our sins. In fact, it was the opposite of that. Sacrifice, service, and perseverance. That is what the cross was. And the Bible tells us this too. 1 John 3.16 By this we know love, that He, Jesus, laid down His life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Ephesians 5.2 Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave Himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. And one more, John 15, 13, Greater love has no one than this, that someone lays down his life for his friends. This is what love is. Laying down your life, sacrifice, service, perseverance, giving yourself for the sake of somebody else. Jesus loved this rich man. It said so right in the text. It said it pointedly. Jesus loved this rich man. And loving this rich man meant being honest with him. Jesus wasn't going to sugarcoat it or dodge it or cut any corners. He was just going to be honest about it. There's one thing that you lack. Jesus wanted the best for him. And love sometimes means honesty that can be painful, that can hurt sometimes. That's what love is. We need to be honest with each other. If we don't communicate and we don't communicate honestly, then we don't really love each other. If we're playing games with each other all the time, that's not love. We need to be sensitive and compassionate and gentle, of course. But there are times when things need to be said. And if we're not saying them, if we're just pretending like things are okay when they're not, we don't love people. And Jesus shows us this here. He wasn't going to pretend that, oh, you're okay, you're fine, you're obeying the commandments, good for you. No, there's one thing that you lack. Jesus loved this rich man. But he was honest with him. And being honest meant sacrificing any need for this man's approval. Jesus didn't need this man's approval. He loved him. But loving him did not is different than needing this guy's approval. He was even will, Jesus was even willing to lose this relationship. He was going to put that risk out there. He was going to say, be honest, even if it meant losing the relationship. And because he didn't need his approval, he was able to be honest. If you need other people's approval, 
You can't be honest with them. You need their favor. So you're not going to tell them what is true or what's honest. You're going to try to skirt it as much as possible. Proverbs 27, 5 and 6. This is a interesting, some Proverbs here. Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Open rebuke. You're doing something wrong than hidden love. And faithful are wounds of a friend. Profuse are the kisses of an enemy. The people who actually love you will be honest with you even if you don't want to hear it. The people in your life right now who are your true friends, who truly care about you, who truly love you, are going to be honest with you. They're going to tell you things once in a while that you are not going to want to hear. Things that are going to make you bristle and be uncomfortable. And they'll hopefully be gentle and kind about it not hit you over the head with the truth, but they are going to be saying these things that are going to make you uncomfortable. And those are your true friends. If you avoided everybody who made you feel uncomfortable, you're going to be avoiding and running away from everybody who's really, who really cares for you. Jesus loves more than anyone. Jesus loves even me, we sang earlier. But He doesn't need our approval. And because he doesn't need our approval, he's able to be honest with us. There's one time Jesus was being honest with some Pharisees and the disciples came to him and said, do you know the Pharisees were offended when they heard this? And he said, every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted is going to be pulled up by the roots. Leave them. They are blind guides. If a blind man leads a blind man, then both are going to fall into a pit. I don't want that for you. This this is I'm being honest with you here. If you need someone's approval, you won't be able to love them. You won't be able to help them. You won't be able to say what needs to be said. You won't be able to do what needs to be done. Deirdre was I think I could share this. Deirdre was telling this story about this student in her class who said to her something like, I hate you. Was that what it was? I hate you, you can't be my friend anymore. anymore." And what did you say again? I'm not here to be your friend, I'm your teacher. I'm not here to be your friend, I'm your teacher. That's right. If if, If Deirdre needed this child's approval, then Deirdre wouldn't be able to be a good teacher to this child. And this child was baffled by that. She said, the face was like, what? What do you mean? You, you, you don't need me to be your friend? If you need others to like you, then you cannot be a good friend. You cannot be a good parent. You cannot be a good teacher. You cannot be a good employer. You cannot be a good instructor. You cannot be a good pastor. There's going to be times when I'm going to be saying some things to you that you might not want to hear either. But I wouldn't be a good pastor if I wasn't able to say those things once in a while. It doesn't mean I don't like you. It means that I'm trying to be a good pastor or a good friend to you. Jesus often said hurtful words that were helpful. He wasn't saying these things to be mean. He was saying them to try to help people because he loved people. I'm I'm just being honest with you here. This is what you need to hear. I'm telling you this because you need to hear it. When his mother and brothers came up to him, they thought he was out of his mind. Jesus said, who is my mother and who are my brothers? That would hurt. Imagine your child or your sibling saying that about you. Who are... Who is my mother? Who are my brothers? But he pointed to his disciples and he said, These are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Or when the Canaanite woman came up to him, begging him to heal her daughter, Jesus said, It's not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. What a mean thing to say. But her response 
showed that it was actually a good thing to say. Because she said, yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And Jesus said, woman, you have great faith. Your daughter is healed. Or when Peter was trying to say to Jesus, um, no, you're not going to be crucified. This shouldn't happen to you. No, we're, this isn't going to happen. No. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Ouch, that would hurt. Get behind me, Satan. Matthew 22, verse 29, when the Sadducees came up to him, they were trying to challenge him on teaching on resurrection. Jesus said, You are wrong. Because you know neither the Scriptures nor the power of God. You were wrong. You're just way off. There's more here. I could go on. But you get the idea, I hope. Jesus said what needed to be said. Not because He was mean. Because He cared about people. And He wanted to be honest. He told the truth. Even when it hurts. Look at the screen here with me. And let's answer this together. Why are you called a Christian? Because by faith I am a member of Christ, and so I share in his anointing. I am anointed to confess his name, to present myself to him as a living sacrifice of thanks, to strive with a good conscience against sin and the devil in this life, and afterward to reign with Christ over all creation for all eternity. So, if you are a Christian, that means you are anointed to, similar to Christ, say things that might make some people offended. For example, to confess His name might mean that you might have to say to somebody, you need Jesus. You need Jesus in your life. You need to repent of your sins. And they might not like that. You are also anointed to present yourself to Him as a living sacrifice, which means sacrificing your need for others' approval. So that you can actually say these things that need to be said once in a while. Jesus lovingly acted in our best interests at His own expense. We see that most pointedly in the cross, where at His expense, we were saved from our sins. And he also did that by telling the truth when we didn't want to hear it, even when he would lose people's approval. In fact, it was actually telling the truth that got him sent to death in the first place. Are you the Christ, the Son of the living God? Yes, it is as you say. So, if you are a Christian, if you follow Jesus, then this is your example to follow. We need to be able to tell the truth and we need to be able to be honest once in a while, even if it means people don't want to hear it. Following Jesus means telling the truth in love, kindly, gently, but actually saying it, actually saying what needs to be said. And I'll just leave you with James 5. If anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whatever, whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Let's be like Jesus. Let's be honest, even when people don't want to hear it. Let's do it gently with love, but let's not refrain from saying these things. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you were honest with us, even saying things that we might not want to hear, as you were with that rich man, Lord. It's difficult for us to hear some things sometimes, but Lord, we pray that our hearts would be open to you and that, Lord, we would be willing to say what needs to be said sometimes, even when we might not want to say it, when others might not want to hear it. Give us those right times, Lord, and the right words to say so that, Lord, you would be known and that people could know your truth and be healed and be blessed. In Jesus' name, amen.